of the shepherd, knowing the voice of the shepherd. You know, um, like many of you, uh, I came to the Lord in the 70s. Exciting time in the church, it really was. Charismatic movement, Pentecost was flowing into mainstream church. It was an exciting time. And uh, the Holy Spirit was very active in, in lots of ways. And um, there was, you might say there was a tide of Holy Spirit uh, moving going on. But of course, with that came all kinds of things. Some was God, some was even the enemy. And, and a lot of it was just flesh, it was just us. It was just us as human beings. Nothing wrong with that, by the way. The enemy is, there's something wrong with the devil. There's nothing wrong with, with the Holy Spirit and being upon us the, and our, our natural being. That's to be expected because we're human beings. But because in that season, there was a great need for correction, teaching, instruction about, well, how does the Holy Spirit really work? How does, the, how does Jesus speak to us? How does God speak to us? So certainly, um, and... Jeff would know and many of you would know that we did receive a lot of teaching, a lot of instruction in those years, just so that, basically so people wouldn't be hurt by excesses in areas. So I just want to speak into that a bit today because I'm sure all of us, I certainly have, and in my role as a pastor, many, many times over the last 40 years, been confronted by someone who said something like this, God told me to give you a message. Don't ask for show of hands. But it was certainly big in the 70s, 80s, 90s. A lot of that. God told me to give you a message. And as a pastor, it was often very awkward because they come to you just before you're about to get up and minister. And they'd often give you something that you couldn't get your head back on where you're trying to minister about. A little lesson for all of us. If you've got something to say to somebody, this is just an aside, if you've got something to say to someone about stuff that you want to talk about, don't do it before a service. Not just to the pastor, anyone. In fact, leave, leave Sunday alone. That's what I reckon. Leave Sunday alone. Ring them up on Monday. Go and visit them on Wednesday. Leave Sunday alone. Let people enjoy <laughs> their day of the Lord. <laughs> don't make it a day about you. God gave me a message. Always makes always made me feel a bit nervous. And such statements are often followed up by a word of knowledge, something like that. You know, you, know, you realise if only you had more faith, you would have been healed. You know that, don't you? So encouraging. <laughs> Someone came to Josie once when she was deep in the midst of morning. Josie had the most horrible morning sickness. She would be hospitalised and got worse with each pregnancy. She would be hospitalised sometimes for months getting hydrated because the nurse. And a couple of kind gentlemen visit our house one day. Come in. Oh, we just, can we just pray? We just got a word for Josie. <laughs> Josie's vomiting. <laughs> <laughs> what would that be? <laughs> well, God has just shown us that, you know, you, you're just lacking faith for healing a bit of your morning sickness, that you're letting the enemy have a victory in your life. And anyway, I don't know about Josie, I nearly threw the sick bucket over them. <laughs> but uh, was that helpful? Was that from God? No, it really wasn't. You know, or maybe you get unemployed and some kind soul comes and says, you know, maybe if you were living right, you wouldn't have lost your job. These are just some of the things I've heard over the years, not to me directly, but have been said to others. Um, Sometimes people come with a very directive word. Very directive word. You know, someone's got an unhappy marriage. You know, a difficult marriage. And someone comes and says, God, I've been praying about it. God had told me that he doesn't mean for you to be in an unhappy marriage. He doesn't want you to stay in this miserable marriage. He wants you to be happy. So get rid of them. I've, we've had those messages too. Again, not helpful. And I'm not saying everyone has to stay in a terrible marriage. That's not what I'm saying here. You know, we had a very tragic case one day, and this will this will take take you aback. A very tragic one. 
beautiful young man. He was, a, he was a, around my age, young adult at the time, but he had bipolar issues. He would often, uh, if he didn't have his medication, he would go catatonic. Do you know what catatonic is? When you just shut off, you don't know what's going on around you. And this guy, when he was medicated, he, he worshipped, he was, he was in young adults, he worked. He was a, mo- a very skilled motor mechanic. He worked. He was functional. But again, it was the 70s, 80s. And someone came to him and said, you know, the virtue of the you know, the devil's having a victory in your life. You need to stop taking your medication and let God heal you. God will never heal you while you're having that medication. Well, not many of us knew about that word, but he he took it on board and he stopped his medication and about two weeks later committed suicide. An unnecessary loss of life because someone had a word from God that was never a word from God. Sometimes we need things like that. You know, and praise God, God does heal people and they never touch that stuff again. Who knows Spurgeon, the great preacher? Spur- Spurgeon never, ever overcame his depression the whole of his life. The black dog, he said, is with me every day. Didn't stop him serving Jesus. And yet he had the medication of his time to deal with her, you know. I often think of it like this. If someone broke their leg and had a, had a big full cast on their leg and they're getting around like this, we wouldn't shame them and say, oh, what are you walking around with a cast on your leg for? Where is your faith? Be healed in Jesus' name. Get rid of that cast. We don't do that, do we? No one does that. But when some people have got the cast of medication for mental illness, Christians do go to them and say, get rid of that cast. Sometimes with devastating results, which I've personally had the misfortune of witnessing. He was a friend of mine. He was a very good friend of Josie and mine. He lived with he lived at no, Josie's parents' place. It was a board area. Didn't have to happen, but someone had a word. Now I believe that when people do that, they're being sincere. They're not malicious. They're not demonic. They're sincere, but they're very much misled and they're very much mistaken. And uh, when when we have those words put upon us, you know, all kinds of things can come in people's lives, fear, confusion, apprehension. And particularly when it comes to directive words, these become the most difficult to assess and filter. They can be very dangerous. The first question always used to come to my mind, even as a young Christian. I remember thinking that when I, when I was in my late teens. I remember thinking this. I thought, if God wants to give me this message, why doesn't he tell me? Why doesn't he give it to me directly? Why does it always have to be through this third party? But that was the thing in the 70s. We even had, we even had seminars on how to get words for people. Really? Am I, is anything I'm saying here mean that God doesn't give us words? No. Don't mishear me. But as you're going to see, there's filtering processes that we can be safe. We can be safe. So how do we know? If someone is telling us something, whether it's from God or whether it's not, and, and quite apart from someone in church coming up and giving you a word, what about the messages that come to us every day through the media or people in the world we come into contact with? You had any words from Channel 9 lately? Had any words from 9MSN? Channel 7, the ABC? Anyone had any words lately from them? Of course we have. Lots of words. They're not words from God. Many of them are words from another place. But we all get messages And we've got to filter those messages. What is truth and what is deception? What is truth and what is deception? These are important things for us to know. And the Bible has got quite a lot to say about deceiving voices. 
And one thing it says that deceiving voices will become more and more apparent as what happens, as what approaches the return of Jesus. That deceptive... St- Man, aren't we seeing that? Aren't we seeing a flood of deceptive voices? Is it deceptive voices concerning these gender things that are going on? Absolutely. What deception? What destruction is being wrought in people's lives by those, by those messages that are coming through? And we're yet, to see, we're yet to see the turn of that tide, but there is a turn of that tide, I can tell you, some of the things I've been seeing lately, that the world, the people by and large in the world, Christian and non-Christian, are not as stupid as the devil thinks they are. And the lights are going on for a lot of people. And not just in the church, outside the church, voices are being raised against a lot of deceptive stuff. But how do we know? How do we know an authentic voice? I was saying that slide, next slide, I think, learning to recognise the voice of God is important, not only for our own peace of mind, but also for developing a personal relationship with him and for living a life pleasing to him. And Jesus talked in, in John 10 about the shepherd and the sheep and hearing his voice. <clears throat> so the first thing I'd say about this is that God's true voice is biblical, is biblical. God has always called for those who speak to him to be truly speaking from him or it is not good. <clears throat> Here's a very scary scripture from Deuteronomy about not having a biblical voice. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their fellow Israelites and I will put words in his mouth. He will tell them everything I command him. I myself will call to account anyone who does not listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name. So God is saying, I will speak through people. I will expect people to hear hear what is happening, what is being said. But a prophet who presumes to speak in my name, anything I've not commanded, or a prophet who speaks in the name of other gods is to be put to death. Now, I'm not preaching that upon us today, of course. We know there's an Old Testament context there that has to be taken into account. But would it be foolish to miss the point that God takes it very seriously if people presume to speak in his name, right? The principle is the same. The penalty may be Old Testament, but the principle is the same. It should make us apprehensive in a good way. This is not from the Old Testament. This is from the New Testament. Galatians chapter 1. Paul says, Evidently, some people (coughs) are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. So how long has it been going on that unbiblical words have been coming into the church? Day one. This wasn't written in day one, but as close as you want to be. Some people are thrown into confusion trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we were an angel from heaven, even if an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach, in other words, the true gospel, let them be under God's curse. As we've already said, so now I say it again. If anyone is preaching you a gospel other than what you've accepted, let them be under God's curse. Now, it's not us putting them under a curse. It's saying if they speak what is not from God, they are under a curse. None of us want to be under a curse. This was spoken into the life of the early church and therefore to us. And if words mean anything, then we must conclude that if we're going to profess to speak for God, we better be really good at hearing his voice. We better be really good at hearing his voice. Jesus dealt with unscriptural errors, false teaching, all through his ministry. You might remember in John chapter 9, when Jesus healed the blind man, he was confronted with a false teaching. What did this man do wrong? 
What did his parents do wrong? Because they believed that if you had blindness or lameness or mute or deaf, that it was because of your sin or the sin of a relative. That was a false teaching. And so Jesus dealt with it. Jesus dealt with it. He said, no, this had nothing to do with him or his family. He corrected that falsehood. Because the, he corrected it because the people were not speaking out of God's truth. They were not speaking biblically. So when someone tries to speak into our life, whether it's from within the congregation, whether it's from outside the church, whether it's from the media, the question we need to ask first, does it line up with the word of God? I'll go back to this gender stuff. Does this gender stuff seem to make sense based on what God's word says to us about men and women and so on. Does it make sense? And the answer must be, no, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't line up with the scriptures in any way, shape or form. So therefore we know it's not from God. And when it comes to things, if they're not from God, it doesn't matter how anointed the presentation is, we can confidently say, no, thank you, not today. And we don't have to be rude, but we can say, and I've said it many times, say through those, particularly through those busy years, I've had to say many times, I'm sorry, I can't receive that. I can't receive that. And I usually know the spirit of the person with their response. If you want to give people words from God and you're not prepared to hear, I can't receive that, then you've got to really question what kind of anointing you're operating under. Because it must always be open to the person receiving the word to receive it or reject it. They don't have to accept it because, oh, I've got a name for prophetic words. I don't care. If the word you bring to me doesn't line up with the word of God or I discern that it's not from God, I will say quite confidently to you, I'm sorry, I can't receive that. So I'm not going to be rude. I'm not going to put you down. I'm not going to jump on you in front of other people. But I'll probably say, look, what you said, I really don't think I can receive that. And I've done that with people and people have, have said, okay, I, that's fine, that's fine. And if, we, and if we are a person who believes that God uses us in that way, we must be prepared to be humble. Humility is the first requirement of someone who wants to move in the spirit in that way. Humility, it's got to be the first thing you've got. If your identity is tied up in your ability to give people words, your identity is in the wrong place. It really is. Your identity is in Christ, not in how other people see you or not in the gifts you display or anything like that. Your identity is in Christ. And he'll use you if he wants to use you in that way. As I said, when someone comes to us in that way, we don't have to be rude, but we do have to recognise that uh, it, has to, it has to be right with us. It has to feel right to us. And certainly it has to line up with the word of God. So God's word is biblical. God's true voice is also personal. Personal. I think it makes just good common sense that first and foremost, God wants to speak to you personally and not through a third person. It just makes sense. Who are you first related to? Jesus or me? Jesus or another person? Surely it must be Jesus. So Jesus is well able to speak to your heart. Amen? Can you say amen? He's well able to speak to your heart. God has made you accountable for your life. Is anyone else here accountable for your life? Can you identify anyone else? Not your husband, not your wife, not your children, not your fiancé, no one. He's accountable for your life other than you. We're all moved past childhood now. There was a time when, yes, 
uh, a child was accountable to us as a parent. But not even now. My kids are grown. They're not accountable to me anymore. They once were. They're not now. I'm, they're accountable to God. I'm accountable to God. In John 10, as I said, Jesus said this. He said, The gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he's brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. We can know the voice of the shepherd. We should know the voice of the shepherd. And the shepherd still speaks to us in a number of ways. He speaks to us as we read the word. He speaks to us as we are under a message in a church, the, the preached word. The counsel of trusted fellow believers is also one of the ways God speaks to us. And of course he speaks directly to our heart. Yes, God does use other people to speak into our lives. But if I come to Russell and say, Russell, you know, I just feel God saying, you say, the responsibility of Russell's life doesn't shift to me. God still expects Russell to line it up. We had some terrible, again, I go back in the, the era, but it, some bad things happened. We had a couple in our, uh, in our church who uh, were in our church for a long time, but before they came into our church, they were in our church for about 20 years, before they came, and they, they were renting all that whole time. And it wasn't until a later time I found out why. And the reason was that when they, before they came to us, they'd been in another church where there was a lot of chandelier swinging going on. If I can put it that way. And there was words everywhere. Blah, blah, blah. There was a few, the, the church was basically led by prophets. And, and one day, this couple got a prophetic word that the, the, the deposit they'd saved to buy their own home, that God was telling them, and not just them but others, to donate that to the church so they could buy a church property. I'll call that what it is. That's demonic. That spiritual, uh, what do you call that? Spiritual, what do you call that? Spiritual manipulation, and there's even another word for it, but yeah, that'll do. Spiritual manipulation. So those people, they never got their house. They had deposit for the house. They didn't get their house for some 25 years later. And, you know, a lot of hardship and a lot of bitterness and a lot of, a lot of stuff they had to deal with because of what they'd been through, through that thing. You know? And I hope you'd be discerning enough that if Winnie and I got up and said, look, empty a bank balance and give it to us, that there'd be enough discerning in this church to say, can we get another pastor? <laughs> can we get another eldership? But it didn't happen there. And not to say, not just that couple, but lots and lots of lives. Marriages broken up. That Going back to what I said, people told to leave their marriages. People told not to have relations with their husband or wife. You know, you know, give it, you know things that we would say, who would sit under that? But that's what happened in those days. You know, they actually got up and said, right, all the women... Sit up, come and sit in the front four rows and all the men up the back because we're going to show the men that they do not have authority over you ladies. Stop that. Here's another one. How about all the ladies, you to forbid your husband's marital relations for the next three months to show them they are not lording over you. It's in the Bible. It is mentioned in the Bible, by the way, not to do it. Not to do that. But people sat under that in that era, accepted it and got ruined lives. Did we have examples of that in India, Shaker? Did that happen in India as well? That ever happened in India? <laughs> happened everywhere. And that's why we've got to be careful. That, you know, um, and the people would come and say, oh, but they were so anointed. Big deal. You mean they spoke in fancy language and lots of volume and threw their hands around? Is that what you mean? 
you know, terrible things. And we don't want to be part of that. We don't want to be in that. I'm thankful that the... And that does still go on in churches today, by the way. Or variants of it still goes on today. But um, I'm grateful. I've come to a church where Jeff and Teresa and the elders have taught into this church, don't be dumb. (laughs) In simple terms. Don't be spiritually dumb. So I haven't had to come in and just correct a whole bunch of stuff. There's been a good foundation laid and you should be thankful. You should be grateful. I know you are. So Jesus wants to speak to us. Um, So if someone comes and they give you a word that that makes you feel uncomfortable and anxious, I would say it's likely not from God. The Holy Spirit comes and he brings conviction. He never brings condemnation. John 10.5 says, They will never follow a stranger. In fact, they'll run away from him because they do not recognise a stranger's voice. I think it's interesting that's in this scripture because I think there's sometimes... It is definitely good for us to distance ourselves from the voice of a false shepherd, even if that means steering away or cutting ourselves off from certain friendships, relationships. If possible, I know that's not always possible. But if someone consistently speaks in your life things that make you feel, oh, this makes me uncomfortable, maybe it's time to stop having coffee with that person. I'm serious. Make an excuse up. You probably won't want to offend them. Make an excuse. You're washing your hair, I don't know. <laughs> but sometimes that's there. Run, they'll run away from him. Run away from the run away from the voices that aren't from God. Because in the end you can be seduced and uh, your life can be affected negatively. As I said before, I'm not suggesting that in the majority of cases these people are malicious or demonic, they are not. They're usually well-meaning, seeking to be useful. But sometimes the need to give words is founded in personal insecurity as much as anything else. And you're not under obligation to receive a word from another person. You're not under obligation to receive this message I'm preaching today. If you want to go away and say, well, I like some of what John said, I don't like all of it, I'll leave that on the side, that's fine. And you wouldn't even offend me if you came up to me and told me that. Because that's how words have to be given and received. We don't have to be sponges that just suck it all up regardless. I encourage you to test what's preached here, whether it's me or Karen or... Wendy, Jeff, anyone, I'd encourage you to test what's been spoken. Is it biblical? There's an overarching scripture about messages given in the spirit. And if we would listen to this, if we put this on our fridge and we would really hold on to this, we'd save ourselves 99% of the issues we have with words in church. And that's 1 Corinthians 14.3. The one who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, encouraging and comfort. Now, some of you have received words over the years did not match up with that. There was no strength to you. There was no encouragement. There was no comfort, right? So it wasn't the New Testament definition of prophecy. And you were well within your rights to say, I can't receive that, or at least say it in your heart if you're not going to say it to the person. Strengthening, encouraging and comfort. And when it operates in that realm, wow, it's powerful. And remember, it doesn't always have to be veiled in weirdness. When you come to someone and give them a prophetic word, it doesn't have to be something like this. Oh, I just, God wants me to tell you something. And you're in McDonald's. Thus saith the Lord. You can just bring it down a bit. There's lots of people looking at us. It doesn't have to be. It can be, look, I just was praying this morning and, and God just wanted me to tell you that, you know, I know you've been having struggles as a mum, but God just wanted to say to you, you're a fantastic mum. You're doing such a great job. You've got so much against you. You're doing such a great job. 
That's a prophetic word. Did you know that? Didn't have to raise my voice. Didn't need to thump anything. <laughs> Didn't need to draw attention to a whole McDonald's restaurant. Strength and encourage and comfort. And I'll have 10 of those for any one of the others that can sort of get past the letter. And I know you would feel the same. We want real prophetic words into the church because that's what builds us. We used to have a lady in our one church and it wasn't a church I was pastor of. This lady would frequently get up and the pastor did deal with her, remember? She'd get up and every second Sunday and say, God would say there's sin in the camp. She'd go on about this. I thought, well, that's marvellous. Of course there's sin in the camp. It's populated by <laughs> us. That's not a revelation. <laughs> anyway, she toned it down there. She was encouraged to tone it down there. Um, so God's true voice is personal and we love to receive it, a, a voice of someone who loves us. God's true voice has saving power. The true word from God, the true word of the good shepherd is full of saving power. John 10, 7 to, uh, to 10 says, Therefore Jesus said again, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come, they might have life and have it to the full. See, a true word from God always leads us down the path of salvation. It's a saving word. It's a liberating word. It's life-saving. It's life-giving. Whereas false spiritual words have the potential to steal, to kill and destroy. Jesus said, I'm the gate. I'm the gate. Take just one example of a false word that prevails in our, in our world today. The false teaching that Jesus is one of many gates. You know, I've had, I've had uh, conversations with sincere, lovely people, and I mean that, sincere, lovely people who really believe this and want you to believe it. They really believe that Jesus is just another way. And they're desperate that you would believe that. Why hold on to this Jesus only religious position? Jesus is great, but Jesus is only one person. There's lots of ways. And they're so sincere, but they're not right. They're not, it's not truth. It's not truth. And Jesus left no room for such a concept, did he? When he said, I am the way, the truth and the life. I am the gate. Come through me. And as with all revealed biblical truth, we have a choice. We accept the words of Jesus as he gave them or we reject them and we find our own way forward. There's really only two choices. But so the, the, the real word from God always brings life and saving power. Hallelujah. It's good, isn't it? It brings life and saving power. So as I finish this, say, deception certainly exists in abundance in our world. You don't have to look very far for deception. But it can also exist within the church. We've got to be honest and transparent about that. And just because a person becomes a Christian doesn't automatically make them an agent of truth. Some of the time, flesh can take hold. Even certain instabilities can be present. And a person can feel a certain false authority in bringing words over people's lives. We've all seen that. The question is whether it's not that is there, is what can we do to be safe? So just reiterate what I've said. Check out what you hear. Check out what you hear. Check it out. Check it from the word of God. Check it in your heart. Does it really feel like the voice of the shepherd? Then check it with trusted, mature believers who care for you. We've all got that, by the way. You've all got that in your life. You've got an eldership. You've got other mature Christian friends. There's plenty in this church. Plenty, plenty, plenty. So we've always got people we can test stuff with. 
Just a couple of final scriptures that point us very much in the right direction. A couple from Psalms 25 and 31. Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are my God and my Saviour, and my hope is in you all day long. I like to think if David needed to pray that prayer, then there was a need to pray it. Guide me in your truth. Teach me. In Psalm 31, Since you are my rock and my fortress, for the sake of your name, lead and guide me. Anyone else want the leading and guiding of the shepherd today? No, I do. I do. I need it. Amen. Let's stand together. Let's pray. I think I forgot to pray for Greg too, didn't I? I'll do that too. Father God, we thank you that you are our good shepherd. Well, what, a, what an analogy, what a picture of we as your much loved and cared for sheep, hearing your voice, being taken to good pasture, being kept away from poisonous weeds and the things that would do us harm, leading us along the paths of righteousness for your name's sake. Lord, we thank you we have access to your good voice, to your biblical, personal and saving voice in our lives. Lord, we pray you would help us to be, uh, to be discerning, to be vigilant, to be aware, so that we are not caught up in deception in any way, shape or form, whether it's from the world or anywhere else, that we be spared deception and kept in your paths of righteousness. So, Lord, bless us to this end, we pray. And, Lord, bless our brother Greg, Lord, as he battles uh, uh, with a bit of an illness at home. We just pray for your healing power upon him and also upon our sister Lorraine Goodlett, for your touch upon her and upon Kay as well. Bless these ones, these loved ones. Bless them with your healing touch, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, enjoy some fellowship and if you'd like prayer, please come out. Enjoy the lovely cake and other things we have there. Let's flip those chairs around at the back so we've got plenty of space. <laughs>